Gabriel, you are an interventionist and you have been that for quite many years and you started young and you have been using a lot of te technology and have saved so many lives. Uh, what made you turn more over to clinical trials and, and another way of looking upon it and, than you did in the beginning? Well, first, uh, being an interventionist, particularly when I started uh, training in the late 80s, was quite exhilarating because this was the really the upswing in the use of PCI, particularly PCI for ACS. And PCI for ACS is an area where you really feel you've made a difference for the patient, particularly when you do primary PCI for STEMI. We started our primary PCI program in my institution in 1988, so that was quite early. And um, although I hate waking up at night, when I go to do a primary PCI and come back home, I'm usually very happy because I felt I've done something useful. Now, beyond that, I have to say that I think interventional cardiology has evolved for many years around tools and, 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 and toys, new ablation devices, new cutting balloons, new lasers, new, a lot of toys and technical things, but the value to patients might have been limited. And I became a little frustrated after a while not to see a major difference in outcomes, which is why I think that in, in complement to being an interventional cardiologist, I became interested in looking at outcomes and, and looking at registries and trials to devise and test new therapies. You have been, you have been the, the trial is the, the principal investigator in many of these trials. For instance, uh, GRACE, Clarify, Realize, and so on. And w why are they so, uh, why are they, are they more interesting than registry studies, for instance? Can you elude upon that a little? Well, I think we need both. I think we need trials to really rigorously test the value of, of our interventions and our new treatments. And this is clearly the most rigorous way to do it. But we also need to complement the trials with registries. And they are complementary in two senses. First of all, they allow us to see what is happening in routine practice in, quote, the real world. But they also help us identify gaps between the evidence and practice in areas of improvement or areas where we need further therapies. And so I think we need actually both. But I think we should resist the temptation to draw conclusions about the effectiveness or the value of treatments on the basis of registries and observational studies. We should always try to link that to trials. Now it's a challenge because the trials tend to select out populations that are very healthy, very selected, in which the, tr the treatments work optimally. And it is therefore important to complement our observations from trials with observations in routine practice from registries where we can see how the trial is really working in day-to-day -day practice. So the registers are in a way a complement to the randomized trials and also maybe hypothesize uh, hypotheses. Absolutely, they generate hypotheses. But there's also another way that's innovative and that's being used in Sweden and many Scandinavian countries is that the registries are useful to collect continuously outcomes from patients. And that helps set up uh, real-life trials. Uh, for instance, I, I quoted in the Lenek lecture the, uh, the TASTE trial that is being done in Sweden where two-thirds of primary PCIs performed in Sweden are actually entered in a randomized trial of thrombus aspiration versus no trans thrombus aspiration, and the outcomes are collected through the use of the continuous registration nationwide. I think this is a very clever way of doing it, but it's beautiful because the trial results will be relevant to routine practice immediately. And I know similar mechanisms are in place in, the, in Denmark. We would m very much need to extend this to other regions of Europe. I think it's a cost-effective and clever way of having representative populations in trials. So you have, in a way, moved from uh, just looking on, on the occluded vessels to looking more upon the whole patient? Yes, I think generally we're seeing a shift in the inter interventional cardiology world, a shift in attention from the toys to outcomes. And I think, you know, it's like teenagers. Teenagers love toys. So I understand that, you know, for 15 years we were interested in every year's new toy, whether it was a new imaging device, a new stent, a new balloon, a, a new atherectomy device. But now, gradually, we can see the shift. And when you go to interventional meetings, the hotlines at interventional meetings are outcome trials these days. And I think this is the sense that 
the specialty or the subspecialty is maturing into looking at outcomes and trying to establish the value and the cost effectiveness of interventions for our, for our patients. I think that's a very good sign. So you as an example and representative of the interventionist have moved from being a, an, um, a teenager loving the toys at the different uh, congresses to a more, patient, more middle-aged, early middle-aged uh, doctor that looks upon the whole patient. And now you are moving also towards the surroundings of the patient, the, the resources, the finances, the economy and the whole community. Isn't that so? Absolutely. I think that the, the state of the economy is going to increase the pressure, the economic pressures that we feel in healthcare. And we have to get interested in this because society will not be able to afford in the Western world and elsewhere paying for expensive treatments if we don't demonstrate and establish the value. And if we don't do it, somebody else is going to make decisions for us. So it's important that the cardiology community and the interventional community get interested in appropriateness studies, cost-effectiveness studies, and establishing the value of our interventions and treatments for patients and for society. So it will end up, when you are a bit more older, that you will be a politician also? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Are you sure? Anyway, there is another thing I'm interested in because um, what you think about it, um, Gabriel, is that all this with acute coronary syndromes, where we use the PCI mostly, is about bleeding, thrombosis, and so on. Can you talk a little about that and your ideas about that? How will the future be? Yes, I think you're alluding to a very important area. For years, we've been trying to improve the efficacy of our treatments. And we were ever improving more potent, ever testing more potent treatments. But now we've probably reached a ceiling in terms of what we can do safely for our patients. If we further increase efficacy, we're going to have unacceptable bleeding as we continue to pile up various antithrombotic strategies. If we think of an ACS patient, it is not uncommon for an ACS patient to receive two oral antiplatelet agents, one intravenous anticoagulant, one intravenous antiplatelet agent on, on top of it. And therefore, it's no surprise that bleeding is becoming relatively an important concern in these patients. On top of this, evidence is emerging that bleeding may not be a simple byproduct of, of antithrombotic therapy, but may actually have an impact on long-term outcomes. I think it is not unreasonable to think that major bleed may lead to subsequent mortalities. There is some evidence for this, although the jury is still out on the causal relationship. But there are consequences to this. We need to measure bleeding. We need to do something to prevent bleeding. And probably, I think the way forward for our newer treatments in the future will not, to ha will not be to have more effective therapies, but to have therapies that are just as effective as today's, but which are safer. And I think that's the next challenge in terms of antithrombotics in ACS. It's not very easy to, to measure the bleedings. And, and I know from the Swedish, the Swedish registries are very good, but to, to uh, register bleedings as a complication is a very difficult issue, even if we try to do that. How should we do about that? Well, this is one of the reasons why there has been a, a concerted effort to build a consensus definition about bleeding. The bark definition of bleeding is really a, an effort of industry, academics, regulators, clinicians coming together and trying to agree on a consensus definition. And we granted, we accept that these definitions are based on consensus rather than hard data and evidence. But we, we so direly need an agreed definition, a common definition, that this is better than no consensus. We will need to test those definitions, refine those definitions, improve those definitions, but at least now we have a common ground that's accepted on both sides of the Atlantic, accepted by payers, accepted by clinicians, accepted by investigators, where we can have a common yardstick to measure bleeding, and it's the first step to trying to do something about it. I'm really looking forward to that. And lastly, uh, I know that you have um, also been interested in the gender issue and you have uh, some results from that also? Yes, I think the gender issue is a big remaining challenge because there's consistent data. It's remarkable how it's consistent, by the way. There's remarkably consistent data from all sources to indicate that there continues to be some form of bias 
in the treatment of female patients with acute coronary syndromes, particularly acute myocardial infarction, with these patients getting less access to diagnostic workout and therapeutic interventions, including percutaneous coronary intervention. And it is not entirely accounted for by age differences because everybody says, oh, it's just that women are older. Well, even if you account for the age difference, you have shown and others have shown that there is a residual difference that is not accounted for. And I think we need to work on this. And it's, I think it's largely an awareness issue. So raising the awareness of all the medical personnel that's involved in the care of acute coronary syndrome patients to the recognition of the disease and doing something about a disease that is gender blind, I think it's very important. That doesn't mean that there are no differences in the pathophysiology. There seems to be also important differences in the type of disease, the distribution of disease, and the, t the amenability of disease to various interventions between men and women, and we have to be cognizant of these. But clearly further research, a lot of research, is needed in this area. This is an area for major improvement. I agree completely, uh, but there is, you think that there is some sort of doctor's bias in, in how we treat them? I think it's in conscious bias, uh, but uh, I think doctors tend to first discount that a female patient may have coronary disease, and if they agree that the patient may have coronary disease, then they think it's lower risk, and then once they agree that it may be genuine uh, coronary disease with some risk, then they're less likely to offer intervention, and when they offer intervention, they're less likely to follow up on the intervention. So, and we know the intervention is going to be more difficult because, for instance, the vessels are going to be smaller, more tortuous, and indeed that's slightly less amenable to intervention. So all of these factors combine against women uh, who have coronary artery disease, and really I think the awareness issue is one issue, but I also think the research issue is important because there might be different pathophysiological mechanisms at work in coronary artery disease of women and men. Yeah, so we have a lot more to do then. Yes. But then, uh, in, a, in a way, we have to, in some way, change the attitude of the doctors. How should we do that? Education, education, education. <laughs> That's very nice. Thank you. Do you want to add something more? I think we've covered a lot. Thank you very much. For Thank you. Interview.